Hi students, today we're here to talk about early Christian, Jewish, and Byzantine art. So to set the stage for the development of Christianity, we need to pick up where we left off, which is the changeover from Roman rule to Christian rule. It was a pretty seamless transition as the Roman Empire begins to fade and Christian strength begins to build. Beginning with the birth of Christ in zero to three, he died in about year 33, and as we know, our calendar, Gregorian calendar, is based on these facts, based on these dates. So moving from BC or BCE to CE or AD happens during this period of time, and that calendar, that AD, Anno Domini dates, means after the year of our Lord or in the year of our Lord. In 64 AD, Nero outlaws Christianity entirely, and this sets the stage for Christians moving, as you'll see, into underground places to worship and begin to create their art to show the divinity of Christ. Emperor Constantine comes on, and one of his great legacies that he left is the legalization of Christianity, or really the legalization of all religions. He believed that people should be able to worship what they believed, and that happened in 313 with the passing of the Edict of Milan. Constantine also did something else that really changed the face of the world we live in, and that was destabilizing the Roman Empire by moving the capital of Rome from Rome to the city of Constantinople in modern-day Istanbul. So he, by shifting the empire further to the east, Constantine created a vacuum of power that made it possible for other rulers and for Christianity to really take those seeds in Europe and then destabilize the empire. This is the monumental head of Constantine created in 313. It's eight feet six inches tall and it's part of what was a larger overall statue that was probably about 60 feet tall. This was placed in the Basilica of Constantine that we see here and left in Rome for his followers to be able to see. So thinking about this, he himself is removing himself, but he leaves this larger than life statue, the statue that we'd only seen such uh, images in the likeness of Jupiter, the god, or Athena, the goddess. So he is in some ways likening himself to a god, but he's also really trying to impress upon his followers that even though he's not there, he is still able to see them and watch them. Upon the movement of that capital from Rome to Constantinople, from on the left you see Rome to the right you see Constantinople circled, the western portion of Rome becomes Europe the eastern portion becoming the Byzantine Empire, and the Near East, places like Egypt, North Africa, and Spain, become the heartland of a new religion that came out in the 600s called Islam. The decline of the Roman Empire overlaps the development of Christianity. The faith preached by the followers of Jesus spread throughout the Roman Empire, and it was a religion really for the lower class. The aristocracy was still worshiping the pagan gods and goddesses with Rome itself overextended, weak, and increasingly invaded by outsiders, it was falling to disintegration. In order to speak in earnest about the development of Christianity, we need to start by laying a foundation of what Judaism was. Judaism is considered one of the oldest monotheistic religions, meaning a religion that only worships one God, and is about 3,000 years old. Some people think even older. The foundation of Judaism lies in the Old Testament, and the Old Testament of the Bible consists of the first five books of it is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deut Deuteronomy. This is the synagogue from a place called Dura Europis, which is in modern day Syria. Dura Europis was considered to be a very important place for the development of these early religions, both Christianity as well as Judaism, because it seemed that there was some sort of acceptance of worshiping different religions in Dura Europis. There was many uh, different Christian and Jewish sites in coexistence with each other in this place. 
This was dedicated in 244 CE, making it the oldest known synagogue. Looking at this wall, this is the, you see that little uh, niche in the wall there that is called a Torah niche. We'll actually come back to talking about that when we speak about Islam in one of our next lectures. Looking at this wall, you can see that there are registers. So remember, registers is a series of horizontal rows, thinking of them like a comic strip. So there's several stories being told here. In this view, there's three levels of Old Testament scenes. So even though they are part of one larger story, each of them, each panel, is an individual piece of that story. In this close-up of the image of Moses giving water to the 12 tribes of Israel, we see figures with their hands held in the air. This is an orant posture or a praying posture. You also can see in the middle a menorah, one of the earliest depictions of this. The menorah is supposed to be the portable sanctuary that Moses took into the woods and lit as his devotional offering. If we look at the building behind the menorah, we can see that there is a reference to some of those Greco-Roman building traditions, a portico or a porchway entrance. And on the left and the right of that, there are Corinthian columns. We also have a very traditional Roman and Greek posture, which is the posture that Moses is uh, standing in in the middle, which is contrapposto. It's the way that people stand naturally. So you don't stand totally erect as a person. You stand kind of putting more weight into one leg than the other that tips your hips towards your shoulders a little bit into this relaxed pose. Early Christian art had to be hidden. As we spoke about a few slides ago, for a few hundred years, Christianity was illegal, and people, in order to worship and practice, had to practice in the privacy of their own home or another place that they often would do devotional practices were in the catacombs. This was considered a place that the police or the, the army would not come into, so people felt safe practicing there. This is the ceiling of a catacomb in Rome, and it's Christ as the Good Shepherd. That is one of the earliest depictions we see of Christ. Christ as the shepherd of souls, the person caretaking for the souls of the world. So here he has the lamb slung over his shoulder, and he's shown in a very naturalistic and almost gentle and childlike way. This is a mosaic under Old St. Peter from the 300s in the Mausoleum of the Julii. This shows us this transition into Christian iconography that was founded or based in pagan iconography. We have an image of the traditional Apollo, Apollo with the sun bursting behind his head. Upon his chariot, you can see the two horses with the little wheel beneath. We also have the vines of Dionysus, or Bacchus, the Greek and Roman god of wine and the vines of life. Christ is to have said, I am the vine, you are the branches. So we have this mixing of imagery, this mixing of pagan and Christian iconography. The starburst that traditionally belonged to Apollo bursting out from his head, this heavenly light glowing from the head of Apollo that shrinks and becomes the halo that we're very familiar with in Christian imagery. We're gonna to shift to beginning to speak about some Christian buildings. And the first that we'll see are centrally planned buildings. These were used primarily as baptistries, mausoleums, or martyriums. So baptistry was a place to baptize, which is a ritual that's used to cleanse the original sins of the faithful in the Christian world. The original sin is the idea that all humans are born with the sin of Adam and Eve from their fall and decisions they made in Eden, in the Garden of Eden. A mausoleum is a tomb, and a martyrium is a tomb of a martyr. So we'll hear the terms saint and martyr. I just want to take a minute to dissect what they mean. A saint is a person recognized to have an exceptional degree of holiness or likeness to God, 
So a saintly person is someone that has devoted their life to being good in the service of God. A martyr, on the other hand, is a person killed for their religious beliefs, and we'll talk about a few martyr stories over the next few lectures. The first building we'll see here is, is Santa Costanza from 354. Saint Costanza, or Santa Costanza, is the daughter of, Christ, of Emperor Constantine, so we've talked quite a bit about him already, and he'll actually circle back in at the end of class. There's some new building techniques that come on, and the first is an ambulatory. So the idea of an ambulatory is that people can walk around whatever action is happening in the center. So in this case, it's at the actual tomb of Santa Costanza is in the center. The ambulatory gives space for people to circumnavigate that tomb. We will see images of mosaics, very similar to the image we just saw from the uh, mausoleum of the Julii. The mosaics are images created with small pieces of colored glass, stone, or other images. And those small pieces or those individual tiles are called tessera. Here is the interior of Stanza Costanza, and we are standing in that ambulatory. If you look straight up, you can see the incredibly ornate and detailed mosaic imagery on the ceiling. And straight in front of us are some giant, highly ornamented Corinthian columns. Here's a close up of some of the mosaic imagery. And again, as we're entering into the world of developing language for Christianity, a lot of this original imagery is founded in pagan, Greek, and Roman imagery. And here that stands out as well. You can see a Greek vase on the left, images of vines and trees, and birds sitting on a little bowl of water. And this might be a reference to the idea of baptism. The dove is also a reference to potentially the Holy Spirit or the pure spirit of Christ. There's a mix in this imagery here of Christian and Roman themes. We have images of Cupid. You can see the little winged cherub uh, on the, the middle left-hand side at the top of the image. So Cupid and Psyche representing body and soul, birds and vines made out of this mosaic and tessera. These images are repeated over and over again. We'll now take a look at Gala Placidia from Ravenna from 425. This is a cruciform mausoleum, meaning a mausoleum in the shape of a cross. This is the daughter of Empress Theodosius I. There are blind niches on the exterior, which are shallow recesses which is in contrast to a niche, which is a place made to house a statue. We'll mention the word piety over some of these slides. That is the quality of being reverent or saintly, someone that is pious, is someone that is very, very good at heart. And we'll see Christ in the guise of Good Shepherd, as we had seen in one of our first slides from this lecture. Here's the exterior. You can see those uh, arches that look almost like entryways. They're just a few inches deep, and those are the blind niches. Those are just an architectural aesthetic addition here to the exterior. And on the interior, this first image we see, we see two men framing a birdbath on the ground. Their hands are raised like Roman senators. They're dressed like Romans. And the um, at the basin at their feet, there are two doves. This is a baptismal fountain, and the idea is that the doves represent Christian souls drinking the water of eternal life. And Here is an image of St. Lawrence. He's one of the martyrs that I mentioned we would be speaking about. He's now the patron saint, saint of cooks and chefs, and it's kind of tongue-in-cheek that he is that. He was killed over a bed of fiery coals for his, his belief and his faith in Christianity. He had given his riches to the poor during his lifetime. And he famously said, while he was on this bed of coals, or was supposed to have said, I'm well done, please turn me over. Here's a new image of Christ as the Good Shepherd. Rather than having the lamb slung over his shoulders, here he is shown in a bit of repose. And instead of having a shepherd's staff that has been replaced by the martyr's staff, you can see it's a large cross. 
he has his hand reaching out, touching one of the lambs, his gold robe draping over him with the purple uh, sash over it, showing his holy emperor-like status. He's sitting on three rocks, and it's thought that this is a reference to the Holy Trinity, the idea that God is in pieces um, of a whole, and part of those are the Father, which is Christ, the, I'm sorry, the Father, the all-seeing Father, the Son, which is Christ, and then the Holy Ghost, this kind of ever-present uh, being. San Vitale is one of my favorite buildings from this period of time. It's a centrally planned octagon, and in order to create more vertical space on the interior, there's a new idea that's implemented, which is the form of exterior buttressing. These are projections or stone walls built on the outside in order to help shift weight and push weight out of the interior in order to have as few columns as possible. Here we're going to see Christ in the guise of Salvador Mundi. So much like Christ in the guise of, of the Good Shepherd, these are different costumes or different personalities that Christ slips on in order to maybe teach us some different aspect of what we need to learn. So Salvador Mundi means savior of the world. Here's the exterior. And if you look on the right hand side, you'll see these free floating brick supports that are kind of winging out from the building. You see they're, they're attached to a large pier on the right hand side of the building. And these are those exterior buttresses. When we eventually will talk about the Gothic period of time, we'll see these used in such an extreme and large way. But here what they're doing is they're keeping that pier from falling out. That pier is taking so much weight of the building and it's just adding extra support to continue to push that pier in back in towards the center of the building. Here's the lofty interior of San Vitale. And the first thing you notice looking straight up the center aisle is that there is a small lamb with a halo on top of his head in the middle. And he is being supported by four angels sitting on globes. As we mentioned, we'd be seeing Christ in many different guises. And this is Christ in the guise of a more Byzantine looking character, so the heavy eastern beard and long hair. There's something distinctly Byzantine about these capitals. They don't fall to any of the previous several hundred years of capital and column uh, regiments, the Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian. That is faded away. These are distinctly Byzantine in their open lace work, their Near Eastern horse motif at the top, the foliage behind the horses. If we look at the end apse here, we can see that image of Christ as Salvador Mundi. He is seated in his purple robe on the globe of the world. Let's take a minute and look at these robes here, the folds in them, the articulation that hints at the understanding of the way fabric moves, but it's almost like we had lost a bit of what the Greeks and Romans taught us about art and how to create dimensionality in art. He's handing a jeweled crown to St. Vitalis with his right hand, and on the left hand side we see Bishop Ecclesius holding up the church we're standing in. Behind Christ's head is a halo, this stylized change from that early uh, initial Apollo sunburst. This is a continuation of telling us the story, the story that we can see just with our eyes without having to know anything else, that someone that has this halo, has this radiance coming out of them, is of some sort of holy importance. In this case, the cross we see is something we call the Greek cross, the plus sign behind his head inside the halo. That is an early evolution of the halo. Here is Emperor Justinian. He is shown on the right hand of Christ, that image we just looked at. If you would zoom out a bit and look to our left, Christ's right hand, here is this panel. He is shown in this heavy, rich purple robe, a halo around his head, his crown on. He's holding a bowl, that is a bowl that holds the Eucharist or the bread that is used in communion. 
He's protected by his military. He's shown with his military prowess, but he's also really surrounded by the people of the church, the clergy from the church. And this is important. This is a transition from just being a ruler, a king, to somebody that is inextricably intermarried with the will, the needs of the church. He's shown on a gold background. It's very striking in person. And if you look at their feet, the feet of all the, the characters in this frame, it's almost like they're floating in space. There's not really a sense of gravity or an understanding of gravity and perspective. This is the court of Theodora. This is Justinian's wife and partner. This is shown on the left side of Christ or the least favorite side of Christ. Theodora was from very humble beginnings. Her father was a bear trainer, believe it or not, for the court in Constantinople. Her mother, not much is known about her except for that she was a dancer and an actress. And Theodora and her sisters early in life were courtesans or prostitutes. She was constantly feeling like she had to prove herself in the eyes of the world. Justinian found her, loved her, brought her up, married her. And she, as a, as a person, as a character, was constantly having to fight against that humble background. Unlike Justinian, who's just floating in gold space, Theodora is shown in the apse of a church. So it's important for her to be placed in the church. And there's a reference, if you look diagonally, going from her beaded chest through the, the bowl that's being held there out to that fountain that's behind the curtain or poking out from the curtain, that fountain is a baptismal fountain. So it's really reinforcing the idea that anyone can seek redemption through baptism. Anyone is allowed to have a fresh start. Here's a close-up of Theodora's face. And we had mentioned that idea, the mosaic created of small pieces of stone or glass or tile. This is a detail of the tessera. And you can see how exquisitely pieced together this is, the boldness of color, and how for something that's about 1,500 years old, it's still so vibrant and clear and crisp. Hagia Sophia is considered to be one of the most beautiful structures that was ever built. It was designed by Greek mathematicians and it was eventually captured by the Turks in 1453 and has been in control of the Islamic world. It had been a mosque for many years. Now it is open for people to visit. But it has this wonderful marriage between the two worlds, that tension, that uh, thousand, 1500 year old tension between these two faiths. So Hagia Sophia, built in 537, meant holy wisdom. You'll see when we look at the images, the interior is so massive. And the reason they were able to achieve that is these, you'll see the upside down curved triangles called spandrels that were able to open up the dome space. And those spandrels push the weight of the walls onto something called a pier, which are large rectangular supports. A pendentive is a constructive device that allows the circular dome to be put on top of those spandrels. Let's take a look at what that is. So the four towers you see at the corners of Hagia Sophia were not original. Those are called minarets, and that is a type of prayer tower that Muzin would go to the top of and call out to let people know it was time for them to pray. So that is an addition from the Islamic period of this building. Here is the interior of Hagia Sophia, and you can see how open and airy it is with the bright gold walls, the angels painted on the pendentives. And what I love about this building and about the, these, this image and perspective is you can see the Islamic script below the images of Christianity. So this marrying of the two worlds, the marrying of the two imagery. This building was used initially as a Christian church for about a thousand years and then as an Islamic uh, mosque for several hundred years. And then in the early 1900s, it was opened up as a museum to the public. One of my favorite types of early Christian and Middle Age art is the icon. This idea that you could create an image that would give you direct access to that holy person, a direct communication to the being that the image represents. 
This image here is, a, is an icon of St. Peter. St. Peter is the one to have carried the keys to the gates of heaven. He was one of the evangelists. Just as we see Christ in different guises, at times we will see Mary in different guises. And here is Mary, the mother of Christ. She is enthroned as the queen of heaven. So she's shown seated in a, a bejeweled throne, surrounded by attendants. In her lap is Christ in a different guise than we've seen before. This is Christ as a homunculus, which is a fully formed human the size of a baby. So if you look close at his face, he looks like a young adult, not the face of a child. A patron is a person who commissions a piece, so somebody that commissions or gives money to a piece, and that is who we believe is in the front of this image on the lower left-hand side, the patron who would have given the funds in order to create this image. There was a controversy in the 8th and 9th century. People thought that icon worship, the veneration of these images, was wrong. There became a group that broke out called the iconoclasts, or the breakers of image. They believed that this idol worship would lead to idolatry, or the worship of the image rather than the worship of what it represents. The iconophiles were in favor of using images, and that largely existed in the western part of the empire. Here's another image of Mary enthroned, holding, holding baby Jesus, also in the guise of homunculus. Jesus is giving the gesture of blessing. So even as this small child, Christ is in a position to bless the masses. Mary is shown in this bejeweled outcove, seated on this bejeweled bench with her golden halo above her head. Christ with his miniature Greek halo behind his head. Her in this rich, luscious robe with, with symbols of flowers on her forehead and on her shoulders. It's this otherworldly, beautiful image coming to us where she's floating in space, even though her feet are grounded on the mat beneath her. She is shown as floating in this heavenly vault. And although we have the same gold background here, we have a very different image. This is Christ on the hill of Calvary. This is the hill that he was crucified on. And we'll talk about this a little more in our next few slides as we see a really incredible triptych that talks about this event a bit. On his right is his mother, the Virgin Mary. The Virgin Mary is to have given birth to Christ without having had intercourse. So she, that's why she is called the Virgin. Christ is considered somebody that was born in an immaculate conception or a miracle. On Christ's left is St. John. So behind Christ's head up high is the sun and the moon. There was a, supposed to have been an eclipse at the time of Christ's death. If we look at the body and the shape of Christ, there's an S curve to him, something that defies gravity. Mary's arms crossed mimic the horror of the cross. Christ's body is spitting out blood that gravity is pulling down. So gravity exists for his wounds of his hand, his chest, his feet. Mary's desperation, her hands grasping and pointing, John holding his face in mourning. All of them with these heavenly halos above their head. Here we have Christ in a different guise. He's in the guise here as teacher or pantocrator, which is considered to be the ruler of all. He is inspiring awe, command, obedience, penance, and faith of his followers. He's stern and sharp, dominating over the vision, dominating over the universe. This is not a Christ to take lightly. This is not Christ as a child in the guise of gentle savior. This is the Christ to be feared and venerated. Constantine left a very mixed legacy. He certainly did a lot of damage during his life. A lot of people venerate him because of his legalization of Christianity. We had spoken about the movement of the capital of the empire from Rome to Constantinople, how that had changed and displaced uh, the, the, the central rule. This is a triptych or a three-paneled piece of art. The sides of this, the left and the right, are made to fold over the center so that it could be easily transported. This triptych is believed to contain relics of Christ's cross. 
and it has scenes from the legend of the true cross. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. I want to just talk a bit about the uh, method of creating this and some of the imagery we're looking at here. So you can see that there's these little columns on the left and on the right these little tiny Corinthian columns. In the center, we have these wonderful little additional triptychs. I hope you can see my marker here. So these are, these are two other triptychs that could fold up themselves. Behind these little triptychs is supposed to be where the true cross pieces are. In the center of this, we see the cross, we have angels, and on the bottom here, we have different saints surrounding the cross. The construction of this overall is a technique called cloisson. Cloisson is, is a filigree gold that is filled with little bits of enamel, uh, which is often crushed up precious gemstones. So all the images we're gonna be looking at closer there's a gold frame that is set, almost like you can think of it as stained glass done with gold, where the little imageries we're seeing, the little different bits, are made up of crushed, semi-precious, and precious stones. So on the bottom here, we have Christ and St. Helena above two archangels and flanked by four Byzantine saints. The smaller triptych on the top shows the crucifixion event with the Virgin and John the Apostle. Behind that is where the, the nail head and fragments are in a silk pouch. When those triptychs are closed, on the top here we're seeing the Annunciation. That's a really important moment in, uh, in the, the story of Christ's coming. The Annunciation is when the angel Gabriel comes to the Virgin Mary a young woman, and tells her that she is going to bear the, the Christ child, bear the Son of God. This is the left side of the panel. And this, this account that I'm going to relate to you is complex and has been debated uh, about what the emperor actually saw and what the story actually was. But on the bottom, what we're seeing here is an angel coming to Christ in his sleep. And the angel tells him that if he paints the monogram of the Greek letters chi and rho, which looks like X and P, on the shields of his soldiers, he would be victorious in a battle that was upcoming against Maxentis. In the second part here, this is the battle against Maxentis, and Constantine is indeed victorious. As a result, his faith is reinforced and that is when he becomes a Christian through the practice of baptism here at the top. And you can see him in the baptismal fount being baptized. On the right hand side, this is the story of St. Helena. This is, this is Constantine's mother. And on the bottom panel here, this is St. Helena. She goes to Jerusalem and she asks where Calvary is. She goes to the Calvary Hill, the hill that Christ was crucified on, and digs up three crosses. Christ was crucified with two thieves, and all three crosses are pulled up by the army here. Those crosses are then carried to the bed of a dying or recently deceased boy. They are waved over him, and he is revived when the true cross passes over him. So the story here, the idea is that she found the true cross several hundred years after the death of Christ. And in this relic are artifacts or relics of that true cross. Constantine's vision of a unified Rome does not prevail. The territory was too vast. Successors partitioned the empire into eastern and western halves, each with its own empire, emperor rather. Within 150 years, the western empire empire has fallen, overwhelmed by a massive influx of Germanic peoples arriving from the north and the east. The Western Church, based in Rome, preserved its imperial organization and religious authority, but true political and military power had passed to the local leaders of, of the newcomers who settled throughout the lands of Western Europe. It is to these people and their art that we will turn our attention, looking towards the Middle Ages.